I think there's, you know, we, we don't have uh, a ton of people, so if questions come up, we can just get to them as they come up. Okay. It's probably fine, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's always good to, <clears throat> it's nice to have people in person because then we can have a bit of a discussion too, which is always, you never know. For sure. Okay, well, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Helen, for having me here and the Chamber. Uh, this is actually a great opportunity, I think, for all of us to learn. Uh, I just want to lead off with the fact that I have been a certified energy advisor since 2007, um, but most of my experience is in existing homes. And this is kind of new to me as well. Like, I, I've done a handful of files with new houses, um, but I'm, I'm kind of learning as we go along too. So this is, I think, a great opportunity for all of us to learn more about the step code and what it means because it's going to become part of the BC building code as, you know, it's not all builders know that, but uh, most should know that, that it's going to become part of the building code. Um, and so we'll, let's just get into it. Uh, if there's some things that you've kind of covered already, that you don't need as much information on, just let me know and we can kind of skip ahead to the next slide here. So uh, BC Energy Step Code is basically about how to achieve net zero ready homes by 2030. And I'm sure a lot of you know what a net zero home is or a net zero ready home is already. So we're gonna talk about a few of those things. Um, like what is the step code, what are net zero ready homes, working with an energy advisor and why that's important. Um, the, the builder guide uh, is a really important resource. Um, this is something you can find on bchousing.org and it really kind of goes through how to achieve each step in each climate zone. Um, we're in climate zone six. Uh, and so there'll be different performance metrics for our climate zone versus other climate zones. Um, and then talk about the step code metrics, you know, what goes into uh, making an energy efficient home and how to reach the different steps. It's basically three things, right? Air tightness, your equipment and systems, and the building envelope, sometimes in called the uh, building enclosure. Um, all those three things are, are very important uh, and I mean, there's new building practices that are coming online in the last kind of 10 years about how to achieve an airtight building enclosure, why that's important. Talk a little bit about the uh, prescriptive versus performance path for new house builds. Um, most of it is gonna follow the uh, prescriptive path, but uh, the performance path is fine too. Uh, we'll talk about uh, mechanical energy use intensity, thermal energy use intensity, and how those things are important uh, in the building process, how to achieve those uh, steps uh, according to those um, guidelines. We'll talk a bit about air tightness, uh, why that's important, um, you know, Air tightness is one thing that I, you kind of really need an energy advisor to help you um, figure out, you know, it, do you need to go tighter with your building enclosure, that kind of thing, and how that can you know, help you reach a higher step. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about mechanical equipment for part line buildings, um, and not so much about the insulation and R values, so I think anymore, I think most builders are pretty familiar with that kind of stuff, windows and doors, but go into more about detailing and sequencing, uh, which is kind of related to those building assemblies and uh, how that's important to achieve a different step, and then talk about some different uh, examples of mechanical systems, mechanical systems and equipment. Okay, so, I think a lot of you are familiar already with uh, the step code, uh, what it is. It provides a consistent provincial standard for energy efficiency requirements for new buildings. Um, so we have the different tiers or different steps. Um, uh, but, and part of the reason why I'm here today is that we need more education uh, for builders and specifiers on the new performance system. Um, 
So a lot of this information is coming from the BC Builder Guide on bchousing.org, which is a, a, an amazing resource uh, for builders. Um, and the Builder Guide, uh, it's been developed to clearly communicate the step code and how to achieve its performance targets. Um, right, the target audience uh, includes builders, designers, building officials, and the content has been developed to be accessible to any reader with a basic knowledge of wood frame construction and building design. So here we have uh, the steps, right? Steps one through five. Five is net zero ready. Step one is basically you're building to B BC building code, right? Uh, it, it may be a little bit better than building code. And then of course, step two, 10% more efficient. Step three, 20% more efficient. Step four, 40% more efficient. I mean, what do those numbers really mean, right? Like, and how do you achieve them? Uh, and this is when it becomes important working with an energy advisor. Um, when you start off with the house design, you're going to have plans. You send them off to an energy advisor, and that energy advisor is going to model them in the energy software. Um, the only thing that you don't know at that point in time is your air tightness, right? Like uh, the energy advisor is going to be putting in a default air changes per hour rate, and that's going to be a 2.5. Um, you know, really, <laughs> if you're going to be building to code and using, uh, or, you know, building a little bit above code with higher insulation values, more efficient mechanical equipment, you're you're probably going to reach those steps two and three without too much of a problem. It's really the air tightness that helps you achieve those higher steps. You know, the, the more airtight the building envelope, the better your performance rating is going to be. And that's, uh, you know, a really important uh, part of the process. Um, so net zero ready, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what this means. Um, so net zero ready. Um, the path to net zero ready buildings is set out through a series of requirements for energy use, thermal energy demand and air tightness. Performance requirements that have been set were the result of a lengthy consensus building process among several key stakeholders across the province supported by energy modeling and analysis. The process of establishing the step code took a period of approximately two years through the efforts of the Energy Efficiency Working Group and the Energy Step Code Council and is still ongoing. BC Building Code has laid out a pathway to reach a net zero energy ready target by 2032. So it's gonna become part of the building code in 2030, but it's not really till 2032 that it actually kind of kicks in. Uh, each step in the path requires a reduction in building energy use, increasing the performance of buildings. Um, so a high performance building is a building built to high energy efficiency standards with reduced energy needs compared to today's standards. A net zero energy ready building is a building whose annual energy requirements are minimized and could be offset by renewable energy. Um, so the step code, you know, it applies around the province to part nine residential buildings with different performance requirements for each climate zone. So we're in climate zone six. Uh, the requirements are set in steps as shown, um, well, in the slides that we showed just before there on the different steps. And of course, it doesn't apply to the city of Vancouver, which doesn't really matter here, right? Um, and does not apply in federal lands within the province. Uh, so, the importance of working with an energy advisor. So, there's mandatory energy modeling at all steps for all building types. So, we talked about how in the beginning, energy advisor would get the plans for a house and run it through the energy software. We use this thing called HOT 2000, which um, when applied with uh, the BC step code calculator will tell you which step you reach. Uh, with the plans and with that air change rate set at 2.5. Um, so the energy modeling guidelines have to be followed. 
to have consistency between projects uh, in addition to the applicable requirements of Part B of the NECB, which is the Energy Building Code. Um, so energy modeling, uh, you know, is pretty important. Uh, and where I think it becomes uh, more important, aside from the initial modeling stage, is in that mid-construction phase. Like, so before you've done all the finishing on the building and you've got your enclosure, um, then you have what's called the mid-construction blower door test. And so then the energy advisor can come in, perform a blower door test, and that is the stage where you can really see if you have problems with your building enclosure, areas that you may need to work on. Um, the advisor can tell you pretty quickly whether you're meeting your air sealing targets or not. Um, so... Yes, I mean, really, it, it's the air tightness that is really kind of the most important factor. I'm probably going to be talking about this more than a few times about how the air tightness really kind of puts that modeling and over the top in a sense of like reaching those different steps, right? Uh, you know. If you're building to code these days, you're probably going to reach most of these targets. It's just, it's the air sealing that becomes pretty important. Um, and so the, the step code metrics, um, the three things that uh, apply to reaching the different steps. So you have air tightness, which I've talked about, your equipment and systems, so your mechanical equipment, uh, heating systems, hot water, appliances, lights, that kind of thing, and your building enclosure. The air tightness and building enclosure metrics direct the building design toward an enclosure first approach, which is integral to minimizing heating demand. The equipment and system metrics consider the total energy consumption of the building. Performance metrics for part nine and part three buildings have some overlap, but there are also slight differences. And so I guess we, we know already what's the difference between part nine and part three buildings. Yeah, okay. No problem there. Um, and so there's a builder guide web tool which works in conjunction which, with this uh, BC builder guide. Um, so the builder guide has a lot of interactive uh, interfaces that enables des uh, users, designers, builders, and building officials to quickly find topics relevant to their climate zone, target step, and building type. The web tool as well as the BC Builder Guide have been developed specifically for wood frame part nine homes and wood frame part nine and part three low and mid rise residential buildings. So the guide provides an overview of enclosure types, mechanical efficiencies and design features and strategies that may be used to reach each step within each climate zone of BC. So you have specific illustrations and descriptions of enclosure assemblies mechanical systems and air tightness requirements, some of which we'll get into today. Um, in addition to specific measures to meet step code targets, the guide also includes information on the general principles and strategies for designing energy efficient buildings. These principles may be used more widely than for achieving the step code targets as they demonstrate best practices in the industry. So you can find these um, on bchousing.org or you can find them on the step code website, the BC step code, which have a um, lot of important resources there. Um, and so you, your uh, prescriptive versus performance path in new house builds. Um, so current compliance for part nine buildings, prescriptive path, the building is designed and constructed to, to comply with prescriptive requirements the BC Building Code, subsections 9.362 to 9.364, or the performance path. And the performance path uses the parameters set out in the BC Building Code 9.365 to complete an energy modeling for the building and design and construct it to achieve the same energy performance as a reference house, which is gener generated by using subsections 9.362 to 9.364 be found in the building code. Step one, compliance building is to be designed and constructed to comply to the percentage lower than reference house performance target set out in 9.36.6. Both energy modeling and air tightness testing are required. 
and then steps two to five, the compliance building to be designed and constructed to comply with the step code performance targets. Targets include air tightness requirements, maximum energy use used by the building equipment and systems, and maximum thermal energy demand. So we'll get into this a little bit more here, the uh, thermal demand and mechanical energy use. Um, Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And just because uh, by 2032, I think it's going to be, you know, step three that most builders will have to reach, that the performance path um, will be the one mostly pursued. And the prescriptive path will just be one where you're basically able to meet code, right? Um, but yeah, it, it definitely the performance path is going to be be one that uh, is mostly used. So let's talk a little bit more about this mechanical energy use intensity. Um, MEUI. It's the metric for mechanical and systems energy use over a year. It's estimated by using an energy model in accordance with BC, BC Article 9.36.6.4 normalized per square meter of area of conditioned space and expressed in kilowatts per meter square over the year. The MEUI includes space heating and space cooling, fans, service water heating, equipment, pumps, and auxiliary HVAC equipment. The MEUI metric includes additional allowance for buildings with floor areas equal to or less than 2,357 square feet as small houses would otherwise have difficulty meeting the targets. Additional allowances are also provided for buildings which include mechanical cooling in at least 50% of their floor area to remove a barrier to provide cooling where it is necessary. Now, uh, when an energy advisor is going to model a house, uh, they'll be able to generate, uh, it's basically a flow sheet through the BC uh, step code whether your mechanical energy use intensity meets the required targets for each step. So they will model the building with the size and the, the HVAC equipment being used and will be able to generate pretty quickly uh, whether they meet the targets or not. So the mechanical energy use intensity, it, it excludes electrical loads such as miscellaneous receptacles and lighting. So it's mostly just the HVAC equipment. Um, so then you get into your total energy use intensity, TEUI. It's the metric of total energy use over a year, estimated using an energy model in accordance with BC Building Code Article 10.2.3.4. Normalized per square meter, square meter of area of conditioned space and expressed in kilowatts per square meter a year. Mechanical equipment included in the TEUI are space heating, space cooling, fans, service water heating equipment, pumps, auxiliary HVAC equipment, as well as miscellaneous receptacles and appliances and lighting. Can I ask a question in regards to, um, like when you talk about fans, like yeah. what's your CFM, what's your over 1,000 CFM for someone who has a 10-inch duct? Does that affect your blow test? And is that, is that something that you need to know prior to? Yeah, that's not going to affect the air test just because those systems won't be running during the course of the test. But it, what it may affect, um, say, if your venting isn't properly sealed or doesn't have a good damper on it, right? Yeah. And so if those dampers aren't installed or those vents aren't sealed, and sometimes you can find that in the bigger uh, range hood fans, right? And, you, you know... Uh, and sometimes even it, say if someone's installing wood stove or something like that and you have these vents and if they're not properly sealed like <laughs> I did a new a new house uh, build the other day and I went it, it had been built you know I modeled it off of the plans and everything was going just fine and then I arrived at the place and the air test was just like it was way leakier than than the, the target rates and most of it was because of the wood stove uh, vent wasn't sealed properly and also you know 
this was, it was like a package home that they had ordered, uh, you know, tongue and groove. And this thing had just settled, you know, within a few months. And the, the window seals were all out of whack. So this, this building was getting way more air leakage than, than was necessary. And uh, so, yeah, the, the fans and the equipment, they, those won't be running and those won't really affect the air test. But it's, it's definitely the seals and the, the vents that, and that's something that you'll be able to kind of figure out by doing a mid-construction blower door test, right? Um, well, if that equipment is installed, right? Sometimes you're, you're due for a surprise if uh, you show up and then, you know, some extra fans or, you know, <laughs> vents have been installed since the time you did the mid-construction blower door test. Do you see solar rock vents being part of the code? I mean, I know it's just net zero ready, not net zero. Right. Net zero ready. I mean, those solar rough ends, uh, we can't really talk too much about that, can we? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. We're energy agnostic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, good, good. Awesome. Yeah, and, and that should be addressed as part of the design process, right? Like whether you're going to be putting it on the roof or if it's on a separate structure or, you know, how it's going to tie in to the, uh, the electrical. Like I've, I've done some existing house builds where they've installed solar and I've come back and their air leakage rate is all of a sudden higher, right? And it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And Right, exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, total energy use intensity includes electrical loads such as miscellaneous receptacles and lighting. Um, so now our next metric is the thermal energy demand intensity. And so that's more uh, solar heat gains and stuff through your assemblies like windows and doors, right? Um, thermal energy demand intensity metric addresses energy gains and losses through the building enclosure. Teddy limits the annual heating required by the building for space conditioning and for conditioning of ventilation air, estimated by using an energy model, normalized per square meter area of conditioned space. Teddy considers thermal transmittance of the building enclosure components, including assemblies, windows, doors, skylights, solar heat gains through the building, enclosure components, air leakage through the air barrier system, internal heat gains from occupants and equipment, and heat recovery from exhaust ventilation. So, uh, again, when the house is modeled through the energy file, um, things will be, values will be entered like overhangs on the windows, you know, how much they overhang, how high is the header height, so what kind of shading on the windows, what direction are the windows facing, because that's quite important as well. Um, and what types, uh, so when all that stuff is entered into the energy modeling, it again will generate, you know, whether you meet these requirements or not for the different steps, right? So some of the companies, I mean, you can go to a triple gain, which, or triple uh, pane, which is good for like insulation factor, which I'm sure will yep. Right. So is that better or worse because you want the solar gain to help keep the home during the winter? Yeah. It, impact, if you upgrade the glass, will it impact the heating? Yeah, I mean, again, it, it all depends on the way, where the window is situated and, you know, how many windows in that direction you have because still, we, even with the highest performance window out there, it's only going to really have an R value of 7. Right, and now these, you know, the modern building code walls, you're getting walls of up to R50, sometimes more, you know, like minimum, you're gonna be going like R22, I think, you know, in a two by six framing construction. And so, um, you know, it, it really all depends on what direction it's facing, you know, like in your solar heat gains and all that. And right. Yeah, during the winter you want to maximize those. Yeah. 
Totally. And so there's, you know, there's a bunch of factors that are involved, right? Like wh where do you situate your building and in, in what, dir what direction is it situated? And then, you know, how many windows do you have on your north side versus your south side? And that's where kind of, I think it's more important for direction and situation and shading and, and what kind of shading versus, you know, the performance of the window. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, thermal, um, Teddy considers the same factors for part nine and part three buildings. So they're, they're both the same there basically. Um, greenhouse gas intensity, that's not really as applicable in our climate zone. It only really applies for the city of Vancouver, but it's still useful for energy modeling calculations, right? So greenhouse gas emissions is associated with the use of all energy utilities on site. Um, this metric is calculated using energy consumption from the energy model. And yeah, so it, it, it's something that the, the software can generate and say, this is your greenhouse gas intensity. And it's, it's not really in this climate zone going to be important for reaching a different step, but it's still useful energy uh, information to have. Um, so achieving your Teddy targets, right? Um, so building form and exposure form factor. Form factor refers to a building's overall shape, its form and its size. A building's massing is central to the achievement of Teddy targets. And that the more complex a building shape, the greater the number of opportunities for heat loss through the enclosure. A building with several complex junctions and corners will lose far more heat through the enclosure than a building that has been designed as a simple solid form. So form factor can also be assessed in terms of a building's vertical surface area to floor area ratio, uh, VFAR. That's not a very roll off the tongue acronym, but uh, <laughs> a lower VFAR indicates a lower overall potential for heat loss through the enclosure. As a building's vertical surfaces, for example, walls tend to have lower R values than vertical surfaces. For example, roofs. Higher VFAR values are often a function of the building's floor plate size as well as the level of articulation or complexity. So here, here you have a you know, graphic um, of your different kind of building shapes. Uh, simple form, you know, in the first one there, uh, this one over here results in a lower VFAR. Moderately complex form results in mid-range and complex form results in a higher VFAR. I mean, you know, the, and again, you, if you're working with a client that wants to, they're, they're going to want to build the house that they want to build, you know, you're not going to have as much in, but say, oh, you know, we want you to build a box house because it's better Teddy, right? You know, that's, it's going to be difficult to explain to someone who wants a nice looking home that they're going to get more heat loss. I mean, uh, you know, there, there has to be ways as well, even if it's a more complex shape to introduce different design principles that, you know, minimize those kind of like complex forms, if they, they want to call it, right? Uh, like roof lines and stuff like that. What about ICF blocks in basements or in the Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it all depends as well, right? Like, the, the great thing about the ICFs is, uh, you know, you're going to have better thermal performance in the foundation, and that can be one of the biggest sources of heat loss, right, is the foundation. It, it can also help you with that kind of enclosure-first approach where it's a little easier to tie in your floor joists onto that ICF and get that kind of like airtight building envelope going, right? Um, you know, it's also more expensive, obviously. And, uh, you know, it takes a little more uh, planning between the, uh, between the different trades to tie in with that uh, building envelope. Um, 
And there's, de there's definitely more resources in that builder guide that goes into a little more detail of those ICFs and how to tie them in. Um, we're gonna touch on it a little bit here. So this, this is a table that kind of sets out um, some of the Teddy targets for the different steps. Again, you're not really going to know this unless you are working with an energy advisor and he's, he or she is modeling the file and, and you know, kind of generating these values, right? Um, but it's just kind of a, you know, a little bit of a guide to show, you know, the different air tightness in the different steps, um, you know, step three, 2.5 air changes per hour or less, uh, step two, three. And so kind of what that means, if people aren't familiar with it already, three air changes per hour means that 30% of your air volume is getting replaced every hour with fresh air. Now, these days when you're, you're building, you're including some kind of a mechanical ventilation system, right? Um, that, that's now become part of the code. So uh, some of them you can set to that, your three air changes per hour or, you know, but if, if your building is more leaky than that, then uh, you're gonna have to do some air sealing. Um, and then this is the table that kind of sets out the mechanical energy use intensity um, for building size and the different steps to meet. Um, now the, for the purposes of the energy modeling, the buildings are, the values are done in square meters instead of square feet, which can sometimes be a little confusing, right? Uh, I know when I started modeling these new houses, the, that kind of threw me off a little bit, the square meters, because you know, we're supposed to be on metric, but we don't really use it very much in, in building these days. But. Who knows, maybe that's, uh, that's gonna change. Um, so <laughs> let's, maybe not, <laughs> get, uh, talk a little bit more about what we were touching on before with the windows, which is solar control and orientation. Um, so solar control should be considered for windows and glazings exposed to direct or reflected sunlight to reduce potential overheating and cooling equipment needs. Potential for overheating varies by building, climate zone, and exposure. So solar orientation. Orientation refers to the alignment of a building's principal axis. Uh, buildings that are oriented to maximize the potential for solar gains through glazing from the south can reduce heating demands. This strategy does not reduce heat losses, but makes use of passive heat gains, which may be helped to achieve the TEDI requirements. Building orientation can also be used to reduce lighting needs by taking advantage of natural light, which can help to achieve the TEUE UI targets as well. To maximize the potential for solar gains, the longest facade of a building should be oriented to face as close to due south as possible. Ideally, the south facing side should be within 30 degrees in either direction, east or west of due south. While many sites are constrained by existing lots and street grids, there are still opportunities to orient the upper floors of the building to the south. Solar shading strategies should be incorporated into the design to avoid overheating in the summer. So vertical shading for west-facing facades, horizontal shading for south-facing facades, trees to shade any facade, deciduous to provide some solar heating in the winter if desired. So this is some examples um, of orientation right here. So building A, non-optimal solar orientation for accessing solar gains. So you can see how it's just like in this north-south access, you have the longest facade is facing either east or west, and that's uh, not optimal. Whereas B, C, and D, optimal solar orientation for receiving passive solar gains since the building's long access is facing south. Um, and then with that 30 degree shift, uh, the optimal solar, solar orientation may still be achieved with the building's long axis facing within 30 degrees of south. Okay. Any uh, other questions on any of that stuff? Okay. All right. 
So, get into some uh, mechanical equipment examples for the part nine buildings. So, a wide range of mechanical systems may be used to comply with step code energy targets. A selection of mechanical equipment options shown for guidance. However, there are many other systems which may be chosen. Mechanical designers should be consulted when selecting systems for part three buildings. So, th this is a kind of a typical example of mechanical equipment uh, and systems here. You've got your um, a baseboard for heating in a separate room up there. Um, some that looks like a solar like skylight maybe up there. Yeah, sunroom, baseboard, um, hood range fan, dryer, and looks like they're mostly using baseboard and what may be an electric Furnace, forced air furnace, maybe. Um, hot water tank. Looks like they got a heat pump or an air conditioner on the side there. Um, actually, it looks like maybe they're using a hydronic system in conjunction with the forced air, maybe. Drain water heat recovery. <clears throat> so, lots of the uh, systems there. Um, so, there's some examples uh, of different heating systems, their efficiencies, um, and what you need to kind of, for each step, right? Uh, Yeah, they don't, those aren't really included in the calculations. Uh, yes, yeah, that'd definitely be part of the air tightness. But yeah, the, the uh, gas furnace, or sorry, gas stoves and stuff aren't really included, which is strange. I, I don't, even when I'm modeling existing houses and I, I'm still adding in when people have a gas stove or a wood stove, but then its usage is always set to never, <laughs> which, and that goes into the calculations. And so I think part of that is that we, we can't really know how often somebody is using these systems, right? So it's hard to get a real accurate calculation of how they affect the performance of the house. Like I know I've gone into houses before uh, where people tell me, you know, this is, I just use the wood stove all the time for heating and that's it. You know, I, I tell them, well, you can't have that as a primary heating system. And I say, well, why not? Well, it's because when, it, say, you leave the house for a couple of weeks or go on vacation, you know, the fire can't light itself. And you, you need to have a way to keep your house warm in the winter, you know, like uh, keep the, the pipes warm and keep your interior warm. Uh, so... Yeah, for some reason they're not really included in the overall calculations of her. Right. You could do that, yeah. And it will affect the calculations. And just for some reason we're told to uh, set the usages never. So, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, goodness. So, um, so we, yeah, some examples of typical mechanical equipment. Uh, and this table shows the relative likelihood of usage of common mechanical equipment in their part nine single family homes to meet the step code in climate zone six, the one we're in. Information was generated based on modeling work adapted from the metric study optimized for lowest incremental capital cost as a financial metric. Uh, this section is not intended to restrict use of any mechanical system or specific product. Part 9 buildings may use a wide variety of options as long as the systems are modeled for compliance with step code metric targets. Okay. And we're going to get into a little bit more later on the different types of mechanical systems and uh, their usage 
and stuff. Um, so detailing and sequencing. This kind of really relates to our uh, enclosure first approach, the building envelope. Um, so detailing is the most important aspect of designing an airtight enclosure. And it's detailing the interfaces and penetrations because this is where discontinued, discontinuities, that's a tough word, are most likely to occur. While the individual air barrier materials and components provide control of air movement for each individual assembly, how and where each assembly intersects, and the continuity of the air barrier across the joints should be the focus of detailing work. Whether at the base of wall, windows, service penetrations, roof to wall interface, or countless other detail locations, the details should provide a clear indication of the air barrier continuity across the building enclosure. So this, this relates to you know, the, the, the blueprints of the building plans, like how are we going to achieve this, this airtight enclosure? You know, what, what is going to be the strategy? And there's many different strategies to use how to tie in the different overlaps, penetrations, where assemblies meet. Uh, best practice design technique for ensuring, ensuring the continuity of the air barrier to draw a continuous line around the enclosed space. This can help to identify the air barrier on building plans, sections, and details. The line should continue around the entire enclosure and connect back to itself with no discontinuities. It should be possible to trace the air barrier without as it were, lifting one's pen off the paper. The same concept applies to individual detail drawings as well. Details should be prepared for all air barrier interface locations, clearly showing how continuity is maintained. Reviewing these transitions early on and collaborating with the affected trades will allow locations with constructability or sequencing issues to be identified and help determine if a revised detail is necessary. Assemblies with interior air barriers must account for all the potential interruptions and interfaces at the interior face of the building. Details for these locations should include all necessary components and products and basic installation measures to provide a continuous air barrier across all elements of the assembly. For example, air sealing using spray foam at the interior framed cavity must be combined with sealant across all joints in the wood framing, such as studs and built up plates, no matter how tightly fitted they are. So here's an example of that uh, drawing that continuous line around the air barrier. So, you know, the air barrier uh, is obviously one of the most important parts of the building enclosure. And how do you achieve that continuous air barrier, right? That's, uh, and, and that's going to be more important as we head into this 2032, 2030, 2032 timeframe, right? Um, and how important for early detailing, uh, you know, it, how, you know, you may not see these, these red lines show up on, on building plans these days, but maybe they're going to become more common, right? Um, and how detailing is an integral part of the overall design process even in the early stages. It should be used to inform and develop the overall design while there's still flexibility in placement and configuration of elements. Leaving discussion of details until later in the design process could lead to complicated or costly corrective measures. So, you know, this can happen when you have many different trades on a building site and they're not communicating with each other or the, the general contractor isn't implementing this kind of overall vision of how to achieve a continuous air barrier because it's it's very easy to you know break those red lines in the air barrier and all of a sudden have you know problems that could crop up you know uh, you can say that yes we're going for an airtight building enclosure you know this is what we want but what if you don't have all the details and if all the trades aren't on board then it could be very easy to uh to mess that up and then all of a sudden the energy modeler comes in does your, you know your final air test and you've you've now gone above that 2.5 air changes per hour because the the air barrier has been broken 
Um, and so if it's not implemented early on, it could lead to problems and uh, that people just aren't aware of. Um, uh, so sequencing, uh, sequencing details should consider construction sequencing and overall robustness. For example, wherever possible, air barrier transitions and wood frame construction should be designed to allow complete construction of the primary wood framing before installation of the air barrier components. This way, the work of different trades can be separated and the air barrier installation can be more easily coordinated. So consider installing exterior elements not integral to the enclosure or structure using standoffs and intermittent attachment points. This can allow the air barrier to only be interrupted with point penetrations rather than extended interfaces like at balconies or roofs. 3D sequence design drawings or drawing detailing may require the three-dimensional drawings to convey air barrier transitions both for design development and as part of the construction documents to convey all aspects of an air barrier interface. The most critical locations are often difficult to illustrate on 2D drawings alone. So, you know, some examples of 3D window installation sequence drawings where they're showing that kind of three-dimensional, all the different angles of the window, which, you know, you wouldn't normally see, right, on uh, blueprints or architectural drawings. And so the, these can be extra uh, details that can be used in... Uh, in your building plan. So common detailing deficiencies. Common deficiencies and challenging areas for exterior air barrier installation can occur at all areas of the air barrier system. The integrity of the air barrier reply, or relies upon the quality and completeness of the installation work. Some common air barrier deficiencies and likely deficiency locations include your structural and service penetrations using sealant and membranes. So you, you can get some wrinkled or fish mouth or incomplete membrane laps. Your roof to wall and other interfaces with various transition materials. Your roof and ceiling penetrations. Window membrane and perimeter ceiling. Above grade to below grade transitions. So back to the, the ICF, um, you know, the, that can be a lot easier to tie in than traditional uh, foundations. Uh, complex building forms and enclosure shapes such as fin walls and projections. So they can be harder to uh, get that continuous air barrier going. So these deficiencies can be avoided by using comprehensive detailing at the design stage and employing proper quality control and assurance measures during construction. On-site quality control of air barrier installation is a complex process. It's fundamentally important to achieve an airtight building and requires substantial oversight. Although the design documents may include details and instruction for all air barrier and interfaces and penetrations, the builder is ultimately responsible for ensuring all aspects of the system are installed and complete. Site mock-ups serve to demonstrate the air barrier installation process and regular reviews of the air barrier installation promotes consistent and complete work as part of the ongoing quality control process. The building enclosure consultant should be notified with sufficient time to review the air barrier, especially at critical details throughout the construction process. However, the consultant will not always be present and there's a risk of discontinuities being missed or created in an air barrier throughout the construction process. A successful approach to mitigate this risk is to designate an air boss who's a member of the construction team responsible specifically for the air barrier. This person should be appropriately trained on and knowledgeable of air barrier strategies, the specific air barrier systems being used on the project and requirements for building air tightness testing. So, you know, have you guys ever heard of this? Uh, have, has this been employed? Have you seen someone? Do this no <laughs> so th this would be i guess uh, a new job description <laughs> of an air boss <laughs> yeah the air boss um
So you can see probably how right in bigger cities there's there's actually companies that you, yeah. that are you know as they're seeing the need for this that say right oh we'll be your air bot your air consultant or your you know <laughs> building envelope consultant and whereas in areas like this you're probably not going to see that right like these specialized companies that are coming up so it, this kind of creates its own unique challenges maybe right whereas like you know who is going to hire an air boss and then where are you going to find such a person that is adequately trained and knowledgeable enough you know to uh, consult people on this and make sure that they get a proper air barrier you know it, it would be someone who's maybe you know has experience in energy modeling and in construction and in maybe experience in the different trades you know it, it sounds to me like it would be kind of a specialized position right yeah someone who yeah exactly who, who maybe was a former building inspector or a former home inspector i mean we have a few home inspectors in town who were also you know building inspectors right like city building inspectors so that that could be some opportunity there you know uh, coming up uh, so yeah airtight building report all damage to the site superintendent uh, you know and so here you have an example of you know the the air barrier that's been missed along this outside edge and that's going to be a source of air leakage there you may miss your target so we're coming up uh, on an hour here. Uh, maybe it's time to take a little break. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for uh, getting through the first part. So we're gonna get into uh, mechanical systems and equipment now. Um, so they can have a large impact on energy efficiency and overall energy consumption. Um, and also have a large impact on the building equipment and system metrics. The acquired capacity of mechanical equipment and systems will vary with the performance of the enclosure and vice versa. So we're going to get into some examples of mechanical equipment and systems that may be used to reach various steps of the step code. Um, this information is not intended to limit the use of any mechanical system or specific product. So both part nine and part three buildings can use a wide variety of options as long as the systems are modeled for compliance with step code metric targets. And so that's, again, something that the energy advisor will help with or the energy modeler. Furthermore, the operating efficiencies that can be achieved with the different systems are not the sole indicator of their appropriateness for use in high performance buildings. Come on. There we go. So, <clears throat> house as a system. It's important to understand that building components, mechanical equipment, occupants work as a system. When incorporating an enclosure first approach, the thermal performance of a building is designed to reduce thermal losses and thermal gains throughout the year, which reduces the required capacity of heating and cooling equipment. Furthermore, the mechanical systems can be more easily controlled where the losses are reduced and the systems can be optimized to re further reduce the energy, energy use of the building. For example, with an airtight enclosure, the code required minimum ventilation level is more easily accounted for and controlled since indirect ventilation through building air leakage is reduced. Where an energy efficient ventilation system like a heat recovery ventilator is used, the energy load required to heat the incoming outdoor ventilation air can be minimized. Here, the enclosure and the mechanical equipment in combination provide energy efficient building operation. So, an example solution. A house with a high performance enclosure where an HRV provides healthy indoor air quality while recovering heat from the exhaust air. Makeup heat is provided by electric baseboards. So that's a very simple design right there. 
Um, so you're sizing of mechanical equipment. Heat loss and heat gain calculations are the basis by which the mechanical heating and cooling systems are selected. In effect, all sources of heat loss, building enclosure, ventilation, are combined with sources of heat gain, occupants, appliances, heat recovery, etc. In order to estimate the need, the needed output of the heating and cooling system. For heating, this is related to the TEDI metric. The required capacity and efficiency of the domestic hot water and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems depends on building size, end use, fuel choice, and energy target. The energy model used to evaluate a building's performance may also be used to size mechanical equipment and systems. As with the building enclosure, there are many possible paths and system choices that will enable the achievement of each step in the step code. Part three buildings will require professional mechanical design of all systems in the building, including the domestic hot water and the ventilation system. Large buildings can produce complex scenarios due to more significant internal heat gains from occupants and equipment. Unique heating and ventilation requirements based on each individual suite and the possible need for large central equipment that serves the entire building. So, both the Thermal Environment Comfort Association, TECA, and the Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Institute of Canada, HRAI, provide guidelines and courses for the design and installation of heating, cooling and ventilation systems. More information is available at teca.com and hrai.ca. They both have explicit methodologies with worksheets and software for heat load calculations that should be used for heating and cooling system sizing to ensure that load estimates are completed appropriately. So both very uh, good resources. I use the HRAI website quite often when I want to find out uh, <clears throat> the specifications on, say, certain heat pumps or heating systems, I can just uh, look up a model number and it will give me expanded uh, specifications for those systems. So just as somebody who's not in the industry, so I understand, yeah. are, these, um, are these tools that just the energy advisor uses or is this something that, that builders use like beforehand so they kind of can keep track of where they are so when the energy advisor comes in? Yeah, there are resources that are available to anybody to use, really. Uh, and it kind of, they can help with the, like sizing of certain equipment. It, it would be more, I think, beneficial for the HVAC contractors. Like they probably have a lot more familiarity with those, or they should anyways, have with those websites. And, uh, and there's, there's uh, different resources that can be used say if you want to size the equipment, right? Um, one is going to be the, the energy modeling, so you have your size of the building. But there's also, uh, aside from HRAI, there's, there's Natural Resources Canada. They have uh, calculation tools to size the equipment. And, um, you know, lately uh, some HVAC people have been asking me for my energy reports, say if I've modeled a house and and I can generate specific types of reports that can really help them uh, size their equipment. So there's many different resources that can be used to, uh, to help you get you know, the right size, um, and what, depending on what type of equipment that you're using for each building. So uh, yeah, careful attention should be paid to the design, installation, and commissioning of mechanical systems. Installation considerations are specific to the equipment type, should always follow manufacturer specifications and industry best practice guidelines. Post-installation commissioning will ensure the mechanical systems are functioning to their specified efficiencies. So, you know, there sometimes is the danger that you can install a system that isn't gonna meet the need of the building and doesn't have enough capacity or it's oversized, you know. It's more often oversized than undersized, for sure. And uh, 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think that mostly falls though on the, the HVAC contractor. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, right. And it, ultimately it's up to them, right? Those are the professionals in that specific field. Um, I know when the Greener Homes Canada program first came out for existing homes and uh, all the rebates associated that Natural Resources Canada wanted the energy advisors to provide that information. Uh, but they quickly scrapped that, you know, uh, because, you know, an energy advisor <laughs> isn't necessarily certified to provide that type of information, right? And I think it was uh, putting a little bit too much on them to say, come up with proper, yeah, heat load calculations. No, exactly. And, you know, and if they make one little mistake in their calculations that comes out and now all of a sudden the HVAC person is installing the system that is oversized because of the result of one calculation error, you know, I think that was too much to put on the energy advisors and that ultimately it's the HVAC contractors that should be the ones that, it, because they're, like I said before, there's many different resources that they can go to. They can, they can go to the report generated by the energy advisor, but then contrast and compare it with say the HRAI or the heat load calculations from Natural Resources Canada. There's many different resources they can use. Right. Totally. Yeah, and, and there's honestly nothing wrong with it. You get your square footage down, you know, um, and your building shape, and then you should be good to go. I mean, they, uh, they should know. Um, so, mechanical equipment sizing, it's based on the sources of heat loss, so your building enclosure, ventilation, and then the sources of heat gain, your occupants, appliances, and the presence of heat recovery. So an HRV, domestic uh, hot water, drain water, heat recovery, uh, and that kind of stuff. So those, those will be uh, used in the calculations. Um, so the energy used for heating and cooling, and buildings, cooling of buildings can be reduced in two ways. One way is by increasing the thermal performance of the building enclosure. So back to our enclosure, enclosure first approach. And the other is by choosing more energy efficient mechanical equipment. To reach the lower steps of the step code, lower, higher, I think they mean higher there. Um, either or both approaches can result in compliance. Okay, no, lower steps. For the upper steps, both approaches are likely necessary. Gas furnaces, baseboards, heat pumps, and hydronic systems all can be used to meet the step code performance targets. So, gas furnaces. Um, common, one of the most common heating systems, right, for part nine buildings, uh, requires, the code requires high efficiency condensing furnaces with efficiencies of at least 92%. I mean, often these days you're seeing 95 or higher, right? Uh, the efficiencies used in energy step code 2018 metrics research full report were 92% and 96%. So uh, they can get up to 98.5% efficiency. High efficiency condensing furnaces use two heat exchangers to extract heat energy from the combustion of fossil fuel, natural gas, propane, oil to heat the air. Incoming air is generally both recirculating, return air from the building, and make up ventilation air. Energy demand of the furnace is based on the amount of air that must be heated to condition the home and the temperature difference between the incoming air and the temperature it must be heated up to. The furnace energy demand can be optimized by increasing the temperature of the cold ventilation air entering the system using heat recovery or by using a dedicated ventilation system that uses heat recovery. So here we got a furnace combined with the heat recovery ventilator to improve energy efficiency. So, you know, uh, these HRVs are often some of the most used mechanical uh, ventilation systems that's now part of the building code. Uh, I know there was a bit of a transition period there where the mechanical ventilation was part of the building code, but it wasn't always installed in the house because often the homeowners would balk at the extra cost, right, of the HRV. And, and for a while, the, you know, the, the city building inspectors would come around and say, yeah, you got your ventilation 
by just having you know fan, fans and hood ranges but that's not enough you know to get the required ventilation you need you still can use that though right as a ventilation system like having fans turning them on when you notice that there's uh, stuffy indoor air or maybe some condensation building up and you can use that in conjunction with your forced air system that's bringing fresh air in um, and that's called uh, makeup air ventilation. Um, so different type of system electric baseboard sometimes people will just be putting that in. Uh, they're common heating systems and they have efficiency of 100%. <laughs> it's also the most expensive way to heat your home, basically, right? Uh, they generate heat by electric resistance and heating element. Uh, yeah, know how they work, basically. Uh, buildings that use electric baseboards, they must provide ventilation through a dedicated system because baseboards do not provide ventilation air. Uh, furnace combined with heat recovery ventilator to improve energy efficiency. Baseboard heaters can be controlled uh, individually. Operating costs. While each heating and cooling system offers different benefits, reduced operating costs for the end user may be worth considering. So yeah, electric baseboard, if you're just using those, that's going to be one of the most uh, costly ways to heat your home. Um, cost optimization approach is referred to as net present value, NPV. So you have your electric baseboard heaters. The advantage of them, I guess, is that they can be controlled individually with each zone. Uh, I went to a house the other day and this person had uh, ordered this thermostat system from Quebec. He had just electric baseboard heaters uh, all throughout his home, but this smart thermostat would adjust the temperature for each zone depending on when he needed the heat. And he found after uh, installing the system that his uh, monthly bill went way down, you know, instead of it just being on and off all the time, that the smart thermostat just gave him heat where he needed it and at certain times. And when he would leave the house, it would automatically turn the heat down. Um, and so they're coming up with ways so that you can use these uh, baseboard systems a little more efficiently, these smart thermostats. So hydronic systems, uh, they can include baseboards, fan coils, radiant floors. So hydronic systems can be used for heating or cooling or both. Uh, a fluid is heated and or cooled centrally, then piped through the building to terminal units. The terminal units are commonly hydronic baseboards, fan coils, radiant floors. Uh, there are many options for central heating and cooling plants, each with different efficiencies and benefits. Um, for example, the central heating plant can be a natural gas boiler combined with a chiller. And we'll have a little infographic here in a second. If both the heating and the cooling are desired, um, boilers typically use combustion to heat a liquid, while chillers generally function through refrigeration cycle to chill the liquid. Alternatively, heat pumps may be used for lower temperature radiant systems, for both for heating and for cooling. Domestic hot water system can also be coupled with the hydronic system. So that's, you know, one of the benefits of using the hydronics is you get your domestic hot water as well as your heating for the building. Uh, low temperature radiant systems can be used in buildings with high thermal performance. These systems require lower water temperatures throughout the system and thus are paired well with heat pump water heaters, which have lower maximum water heating capacity than traditional boilers. Note that the radiant systems may increase the risk of overheating without proper controls and commissioning. This increased risk is most relevant for buildings with very high performance enclosures. Note that it is important to properly commission all systems in any installation. So example of a hydronic system using a boiler and a chiller to provide both heating and cooling. It's like a fairly simple setup. It doesn't really take into account ventilation. Um, so your heat pump. Now heat pumps are becoming really popular these days. Um, I know that the Greener Homes program is really pushing them for this existing homes program because it takes a lot less energy to uh, heat the heat the air because it, it circulates refrigerant that absorbs and releases heat through evaporation 
and condensing of the refrigerant as it travels between the indoor and outdoor. Operates in a similar way to tr a traditional air conditioner, but its function can be reversed to provide heating as well as cooling. Heat pumps operate at much higher efficiencies than other typical residential heating and cooling options. In some cases over 300% efficiency. That's crazy. Heat pump efficiencies are measured in coefficient of performance, COP, where 300% efficiency would be denoted as COP 3.0. Most common type of heat pumps are air sourced. However, ground source heat pumps are also available. Air source heat pumps extract heat from the outside air during the heating system and extract heat from the indoor air during the cooling season. Ductless mini split systems are air source heat pumps which are commonly used to control temperatures in individual rooms or spaces by heating or cooling air, air to air system. Larger heat pumps are generally used as part of a central heating or cooling system in larger buildings. Cold climate air source heat pumps are specifically designed for cold climates and can extract heat from the air down to minus 35 Celsius at about the same efficiency as electric baseboard heaters. They're very expensive too. Uh, ground source heat pumps draw heat from the ground or water in the heating season and return heat back into the ground in the cooling season. Ground source heat pumps are also known as geothermal, geo exchange and earth energy systems and are often combined with a central distribution system. Sewage heat recovery is another type of heat pump system that extracts heat from wastewater. These systems can be used for either domestic hot water or space heating. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so air to air heat pump system with multiple interior fan units. So this would be like a mini split. With, that doesn't work with a uh, central air system or forced air. So now let's talk a little bit about ventilation. Uh, with increased building air tightness comes the need for sufficient mechanical ventilation to ensure a healthy indoor air environment for building occupants. A well-designed and properly installed system will provide the right amount of ventilation and can be used to save energy. Part 9 buildings, various ventilation systems can be used, but each type must provide direct ventilation to each bedroom and living space. Natural ventilation is permitted during the non-heating system, non-heating season to use, uh, so you're using operable windows, but a mechanical ventilation system must be used during the heating system. So this is important to note that, you know, we only really care about this ventilation during the winter months, you know, when, when we're using a heating system to heat our house, which is pretty much six months out of the year, right? Like, you know, oftentimes we'll be turning on the heat in October and even all the way up to May, sometimes June, <laughs> you know, and this is like, what? I, you know, got to turn on the furnace now. So yeah, pretty much six months out of the year. Then in the spring and summer, we don't care about it as much because we go open doors, windows, we get lots of natural, air ventilation. Uh, so here's one way to do it. Uh, a dedicated air inlet and exhaust fan, what I was talking a little bit about before. So a dedicated fresh air inlet, often you'll find those, you know, uh, return air in a, in a forced air system. Combined with a central ducted heating system and an exhaust fan can serve as an effective basic ventilation strategy. This strategy uses the ducts for the heating system and a continuously running circulation fan to supply fresh air to all living areas, even if the heating system is not running. So you can just run the fans, right? The blower fan uh, on the forced air system. At the same time, a continuously running exhaust fan, such as a bathroom fan, extracts stale indoor air. High efficiency fans can be used to minimize energy consumption of the fan operation itself, though, the energy required to condition the ventilation air is often a greater energy load for the building. In this system, the ventilation air must be conditioned by the building heating equipment. And the greater the temperature difference between the outdoor and indoor, the greater the energy demand for this process. So you can see how if you're just using this and especially if it's getting really cold, it's gonna put a much more uh, demand on the 
heating system to keep your house at a specific temperature. Uh, so here's ventilation with a continuously running exhaust fan and a dedicated air inlet. So very basic, right? Um, so then you have what's called the makeup air system. So this uses a centrally supplied fan to provide ventilation throughout a building. Uh, these ventilation systems are commonly used in large buildings, consist of a central makeup air unit with ducting supplied to all spaces or units in the building. The makeup air unit also conditions cold air to comfortable levels before it is supplied to the building. So not quite a heat recovery ventilator, but similar to that. Um, typically these units are gas fired and heat the air through a heat exchanger. High efficiency makeup air units have efficiencies above 90%. Alternatively, air source heat pumps can be used for both heating and cooling and can offer efficiencies above 300%. Makeup air unit can also be combined with an HRV to improve its efficiency. Uh, the BC Building Code requires direct ventilation to each living space. Thus, indirect corridor ventilation strategies such as pressurized corridors are not acceptable. The central makeup air system must be installed with ducts that supply the ventilation air directly to residential units. So there's a central makeup air unit in a multi-unit residential building. Have one on each floor and looks like you have the unit that sits up there on the roof. So now we have ventilation heat recovery. Um, I guess there's going to be a course in that coming up uh, solely on HRV. So we're, we'll just touch on this a little bit uh, about how the HRV, heat recovery ventilator, or energy recovery ventilator, and the, the ERV is more works with humidity in a building en environment uh, and controls the humidity. Uh, so they can be used to recover energy from exhaust air. Uh, they use a passive heat exchanger to transfer heat between outgoing exhaust and incoming supply air with the ventilation units. Supply air is typically ducted directly to each living area and exhaust air from bathrooms and kitchens. In heating climates, HRVs and ERVs are primarily used to recover heat from the exhaust air to temper the supply air, but they can also reverse, work in reverse in the cooling season. The heat transfer effectiveness typically ranges from 60 to 85 percent. Uh, HRV and ERV systems provide continuous, balanced, energy efficient and comfortable year-round ventilation to homes. Additional benefits come from air filters within the units which filter out pollutants and pollen. Single unit is typically used for single family homes. In multi-unit buildings, HRVs and ERVs can be installed in each suite or may be located centrally and ducted through a central ventilation system. Um, and just, just before you go ahead. Yeah. No worries. That you want to dig more into things that you are facing out there that you've got answers to, and then, and then towards the end, if you have feedback on what you'd like to learn more about for our next session, uh, March 16th, then that would be really great to make sure you guys get the program done. Or the same. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> So we'll just go over this real quick about how HRVs and ERVs use a similar system, but ERVs transfer humidity between the supply and exhaust air streams. Um, specialized heat exchanger called the enthalpy core allows both heat and moisture transfer between air streams without cross contamination. Uh, ERVs uh, are generally more common in severe climates where humidity levels reach upper and lower extremes. So in this climate, you'll more often see HRVs than ERVs, right? Um, and then note that central recirculating ventilators, CRVs, use a similar ventilation arrangement as HRVs and ERVs, but without the efficiency of heat recovery and instead use recirculation and direct fresh air intake. So we got there ventilation with heat recovery and ducting throughout. 
and central ventilation with heat recovery in a multi-unit residential building. So it's supplying that ventilation to every area of the home. So here we have another mechanical system, which is important, which is the domestic hot water. Uh, heating of domestic hot water can account for 15 to 35 percent of a building's energy use, which is huge. And people don't often realize that, that, yeah, how much domestic hot water can really account for energy use. Uh, so depending on the building type, right? Uh, domestic hot water energy use may be reduced by selecting energy efficient equipment and systems as well as drain water heat recovery. That's something I don't often see. Like I, I see it every now and again, this drain water heat recovery, but boy, does it ever make a difference, you know? Because um, then, you know, your, your heating system for the hot water doesn't have to work as hard when it, it's got that heat piped back into the system, right? You know, so your drain water, you're, you're draining all this hot water from a shower or a bath, and then it can recapture some of that heat, right? Um, yeah, drain water heat recovery. Incorporating low flow fixtures, shower heads and faucets is a great way to reduce hot water usage, but is only accounted for in part three energy modeling. Um, so your different types, conventional domestic hot water heaters typically heat the water with a gas boiler or electric coil, then store the heated water in an insulated tank size to the demand of the building. It's recommended to have at least a condensing efficiency natural gas boiler, 90% or higher. For higher efficiencies, air source heat pump hot water tank can be incorporated greater than 300%. Furthermore, hot water tanks may be heated by site generated energy through heat pumps or solar thermal systems. The domestic hot water distribution pipes may be designed with recirculation and heat tracing to maintain water temperatures throughout the building. This approach is not very energy efficient. And a more efficient way to provide domestic hot water in multi-unit multi residential buildings is by equipping each unit with their own hot water heater. So that can be more important in, in, in bigger buildings, right? That instead of having a, one massive storage tank that's supplying it throughout all the buildings to have a smaller one in each unit. And this is where like tankless can come in, which we're gonna to get to in a second here. So there's tank type water heater with drain water heat recovery. It's capturing some of that heat, putting it back into the tank. So it doesn't have to work as hard. So in a tankless, uh, not everybody loves the tankless, right? It, it's not right for every home. They're definitely highly efficient. But some people find that, and depending on where it's situated and where you have your shower, it can take a lot longer, right, for the hot water to reach where you need it. Um, so tankless can be used as domestic hot water season heating system for houses as well as in-suite and multi-unit residential buildings. This type of water heater is referred to as on-demand and instantaneous. Well, it's a bit of a misnomer. As the water is heated as it is used. Uh, tankless heaters are generally condensing efficiency natural gas. So yes, high efficiency, but not always the best performance, right? For larger households, multiple tankless water heaters may be required to meet the hot water demand for multiple uses simultaneously. For example, running the dishwasher and taking a shower at the same time. Tankless water heaters work well in individual suites of multi-unit residential buildings as they take up minimal room, allow the occupant direct control their water usage and reduce the need for substantial plumbing installation throughout the building. Some of the benefits. In-suite tankless hot water heaters. There we go. Okay, so another way to reduce domestic hot water energy use is covering the heat from the wastewater. This is an effective heat recovery strategy in residential buildings due to high shower usage. Drain water heat recovery typically works through the installation of a copper section of pipe installed in line with the main domestic drain pipe. Drains from showers with another copper pipe heat exchanger wound tightly around it. The copper heat exchanger is connected to the supply line of the water heater. 
It extracts heat from the drain water running along the walls of the drain pipe and raises the temperature of the incoming supply water. Sewage heat recovery uses heat pump technology to extract heat from wastewater. This system is mainly used in larger residential buildings. So, auxiliary equipment, the uh, mechanical energy use intensity for part nine buildings and the total energy use intensity for part three buildings require that the auxiliary HVAC equipment be accounted for in the overall energy use. Uh, auxiliary HVAC equipment generally includes fans, humidifiers, and other devices that are not directly accounted for in the heating, cooling, ventilation, and domestic hot water energy use. All HVAC auxiliary mechanical equipment like fans should be high efficiency to help reach the thermal energy use intensity targets. Additional loads included in part three thermal energy use intensity metric. Note that receptacles, appliance, and lighting load must also be accounted for in the TEUI. Energy efficiency, energy efficient products should be used wherever possible to help meet the TEUI targets. This includes LED lighting and high efficiency appliances. So, you got your space heating, space cooling, service water heating equipment, and then your auxiliary HVAC equipment. And then in a part three building, your space heating, space cooling, service water heating equipment, auxiliary HVAC equipment, miscellaneous receptacles and appliances, and lighting. So you can see how that's more important, uh, the auxiliary stuff, the lighting, miscellaneous receptacles and appliances in a part three building versus the part nine building, which is only really taking into account the space heating, space cooling, water heating equipment, and auxiliary HVAC equipment. So, we've reached the end of our presentation here. I've left uh, this time open for uh, questions. <laughs> and anything, any, you know, anyone else would like to add to what we've already talked about today? Oh, right on. Okay, well, well thanks for... Uh, Coming out here today, I've heard a lot of good things about New Dawn. Yeah, everywhere I go. So, uh, we're always trying to strive to get to the next level. So, good to get this information. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh yeah, no problem. Yeah, and check out this BC Builders Guide on uh, bchousing.org because um, it goes into a lot more detail about uh, some of the things I talked about in terms of building enclosures, different types. It, it will talk about ICFs and the air barriers and, and how to achieve certain targets, different ways to uh, get that airtight building enclosure. Um, and goes into you know quite a bit more detail about thermal resistance and you know our values for above grade wall so yeah air barriers and a stud insulated wall assembly and then it'll talk about differences um for that versus icfs and different types and and also different ways to achieve your air barrier um Oh yeah, there we go. Insulated concrete forms right there. And then, you know, the roof assemblies, the window assemblies, how to achieve that kind of continuity throughout the building enclosure. Um, just want to get to where they talk about these air barriers.
Oh yeah, here we go, air tightness. So yeah, um, so showing like a continuous air barrier and kind of how to, different strategies. This is a pretty good um, document. So different, you know, approaches for air barrier systems, sheeting membrane, sealed exterior sheeting approach, uh, liquid applied membrane, uh, and all the different materials you can use as air barriers. Uh, you know, like spray foam, rigid foam, and then, you know, your sealed exterior insulation approach, sealed polyethylene approach, sealed interior sheeting approach. So there's many different approaches, the airtight drywall, interior spray foam, panelized approaches that don't see those as often, those like structurally insulated panels. Um, and then how to achieve it in the different areas of the assemblies, right? Roof, roof, wall, windows, and doors, basically, right? Oh, yeah, and where the foundation meets the, uh, the main building envelope. So, yeah, I uh, encourage you to go check out those resources as well. BC Builder's Guide. Yeah. <laughs>